On this episode of Delivering Marketing Joy, we take a look back at some of the best content marketers that have ever been on our show, and we make you a better marketer. Loud noises! Um, one of the things I know about you is you are a great blogger. Um, and in a recent blog I just read, just to prove that I read your blog, right? Uh, <laughs> You mentioned the rule of 99 and 1, and I'd never heard that before. Can you explain the rule and its significance? Yeah, sure. So it's actually 90-9-1. It's not 99 to 1. It's, right. it's kind of hard to say. So it's easier to read. Yeah. But, you know, where this came from is uh, I went to the Promo Kitchen event at the ASI show down at Flo and Santos, and, uh, which is a fantastic event. And while I was sitting there chatting over a beer with somebody and the guy, I don't know why you go to trade shows and don't bring cards, but he didn't have a business card with him. So I have no idea who he is, but he was telling me about this rule, which is that 90, 99, one, 90% of the people that do social media read the content. Mm -hmm. Okay. So 90% of the people will read the stuff that you share. Mm -hmm. 9% of that group will like it or share it or repost it or do something with it or comment on it or whatever, okay? But only 1% create the content. Mm -hmm. So you doing this creates the content. Me doing my blog creates the content. So what you want to do is you want to be in the 1% because nobody else is doing that. Yeah. So that's why that is such an important rule and that why it rings so true, true, okay? And so when I do my social media, that's what I'm always thinking about is, you know what, I'm better than so many other people because I'm actually spending the effort in doing stuff and making time for things and that puts me out there. And so that's why I think that's so valuable and that's why, you know, this show that you do is just so awesome is because, you know, you're better than everybody else out there because you're actually – you're putting yourself out there on the line and doing things, and that's why that's so great. After it, you, you, in your book, Epic Content Marketing, you said that good content marketing was owning media as opposed to renting it. I thought that was a really cool statement. Um, can you explain what you mean by that and why it's so important? I think there's a couple different ways to look at it. If you look at it in the traditional sense, over the past 50 or so years, we've been really good at paying for our media, and we've been trying to look at Okay, where are our customers hanging out and who's built really good audiences out there? And then let's put an advertisement in there, whether it's newspapers, magazines, televisions. So let's, let's do that. And we'll try to uh, distract them a little bit from the content that they really want and just do it that way. And we've been doing that for you know decades now. So that's one way to look at it. And I want to say, hey, I want to own the content. I want to be the story. I want to be the ones that when people have uh, interests, problems that they need to solve, they go to us directly instead of us having to shout and say, oh, please look at us. Right. We're awesome because we have this great product or service and just solve problems through some type of content platform or content brand. So that's one way to look about look at it. The second thing is, and this is what we're seeing in a lot of social media that's going on right now, you have a lot of brands that are saying, hey, I want to be on Facebook. I want to be on Twitter. I want to be on LinkedIn. And I love all those platforms and we use them all in different ways. But the problem is, we use those as our audience building platforms. We're like, okay, great. I'm going to build an audience now on Facebook. And we put a lot of content into it and we build a lot of likes. And then, oh, Facebook changed the rules. Oh my gosh. Now they're not going to let us, uh, now our audience doesn't see our posts on Facebook anymore. And we put all this time and attention in building a platform on social media. And what we need to recognize is let's use those for how we can use them right now. But we could get up tomorrow morning and Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and YouTube. They could just say, oh, sorry, you don't get access to that audience anymore. Didn't you know that was our audience that we built for for you to use? Now you're going to have to pay to play or the rules change in some way. Google Plus is going through the same thing. They've had multiple changes in that organization. Google doesn't even know what Google Plus is going to be. That's my concern is... Just be careful if you don't have it on your own blog or you're not building your own subscription database like through an email newsletter, you can use all those other platforms, but you're probably renting their space right now. So we have to look at how do we use those right now to build our own subscriber database and our own audience. 
Yeah, that's it, it. And when I read that, that really took that to heart because I was pushing through those mediums. And after reading it, I'm like, okay, I really need to rethink this or at least add to what I'm already doing. And, I think and there's nothing wrong with it, right? I mean, it's yeah. great. I mean, we've got a lot of really good examples, let's say, on YouTube, and they build a lot of subscribers. But if you look at the great, like, look at Jimmy Fallon. Like, Jimmy Fallon does a great job sharing those regular updates on YouTube. Go to the end of it and look at all the ways to subscribe. And they're really trying to build an audience directly if they can. Because, you know, great, subscribe to YouTube. That's step one. But maybe subscribe to this email. How can we get more data from you here so we can have that direct connection? Um, you know, and the best content uh, does a couple of different things. It tells a story. So that means that you're trying to connect with um, the emotion, you know, at, at an emotional level with your readers or viewers. Um, so you can do that by maybe using your own personal experience or the experience of others. Um, writers should be knowledgeable. So you should have either experienced what you're writing about or be able to talk to some people who have and, and be able to kind of tell their story. Um, another tip is you know, use how-to articles when you can because people really want to learn. They, you know, human beings inherently uh, want to get better at, at what they do. So if you have tips, strategies, top ten lists, those kinds of things are going to grab eyeballs. Um, length uh, in print, we can run a little bit longer articles, get a little bit more background, a little bit more detail. I think if you're posting on the web, you need to keep it short get right to the point so again lists bullets all of those things will um, increase the likelihood that your readers are going to read the piece that you put up there also your headline is critical you want to write a headline that grabs attention because your headline is your hook to get your reader into the story mm -hmm. um, also if you're posting online a general rule is post about 50% of the time um, curated content, that means content from other sources, about 30% um, of the time original content, and then another 20% or less would be promotional material. So you want to have more educational than promotional material from a marketing standpoint as, as a general rule. Yeah. Um, I think it's also a good idea to get regular feedback on the content that you're posting. Um, Ask your readers, what kind of information do you need? Maybe you can have a poll on your site. Um, we do a readership study every year for PPB, really effective in helping us know um, what are they working on, what is giving them heartburn, how can we help. Um, also, read what your competitors are writing. See how you might be able to do it better. Where are the gaps? Um, and read anything else. Find out what else you're your readers or viewers are reading so that you can see what they like and uh, what other stories can you tell that will help them. Man, those are those are super, super tips, Tina. I really appreciate it. Um, I know, you know, you are putting out a blog and, and obviously I'm reading it. Um, but I would think I would think a lot of people, gosh, I want a blog, but you know, I, I don't know how to come up with ideas. How do you do that? Right. Um, really, you know, um, uh, by observing, I would say, is the biggest one for me. Um, you know, every day something happens that you can write about, mm -hmm. usually more. So mm -hmm. whether it's something that you experience in the office uh, while working, if you had an idea that you had, dealing with customers, dealing with coworkers, dealing with yourself, um, you know, as, as a consumer, you know, in your, uh, your, your experiences, take note of your experiences, both good and bad. Uh, Marshall Atkinson, who is my um, promo kitchen mentor, I just finished the mentor program, which was awesome, by the way, um, and he was awesome, and um, he and I had a great deal of conversations about this, about mining your life for topics. Um, you know, often if you sit, you know, just do a short brainstorming session, you can come up with a large number of topics, because, you know, one idea will lead to another, will lead to another, um, and, you know, recently... Uh, I just recently started the blog, like officially started it, um, so I have a reserve of ideas that I've been tossing around for a while as I like, you know, pondered them. So, you know, my ideas may dry up at some point, but so far this is, has served me well. Um, and one thing I'll add is that I've started carrying around uh, a notebook again. I, um, in college and grad school, I did this, and those were, you know, pretty smartphone days, um, and I'd, I'd fill them up pretty quickly, and I noticed kind of a significant drop in the amount of ideas 
that would come out of me once I started using a smartphone. Mm. Um, and, you know, in the past when I'd be doing something, say I was like in, you know, line at a store, I might observe something that would give me an idea, either a person or, you know, a product or, or whatever. Uh, you know, but now when every minute of my free life was, you know, taken up by scrolling through news feeds and I wasn't thinking on my own, I was reading what other people were thinking and sharing and, you know, and I'm not saying technology is bad. I work for a digital company, so you know, sure. um, I, 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 you know, I love technology. But I encourage people to, um, you know, I realized when, once I realized that was happening, I started trying to take short breaks, carrying the notebook around again, because what I was doing was re relying on my notepad on my phone and using that as, you know, to jot down notes. But um, just being able to take a break from it and to give your brain the opportunity to notice those little aha moments that that maybe you know you would have if your people weren't scrolling yeah. or or if you weren't scrolling through your phone you know maybe you would talk to someone next to you in line that would right. give you an idea and now you know people you know it's kind of weird if someone talks to you you're like oh I'm what you know so I think that uh, I think that was a big one to no, that's, a, that's a great point I, I totally agree I have found that here recently that I need to give myself time to hear my own thoughts um, so I, I think that's a great point. I like the notebook idea. Hey, thanks for watching, but wait, can you do me a favor? Please subscribe to my channel. If you haven't done it already, the way to do it's right over here. And hey, if you want to watch the last episode, check that out over here. Again, before you leave, subscribe.